In this video, we're going to be taking a figure and placing him in the background. This is a figure that was photographed over a green screen. And so we're going to be dropping out the green screen, dealing with some of the color problems that arise from uh, photographing a character, a figure in front of a green screen like this, the reflections that occur on the skin. And this is largely going to be concerned with how to manage the light and the color to merge these two elements together, these two images. So there's a similar process that I walked through this in, a, in another tutorial, the one with a, a woman in binoculars standing on a mountain. So this has elements that are similar, but the circumstances are a little different. So we'll spend some time looking at that. So I open up these two images. I have uh, my landscape, which is sort of this uh, cobblestone plaza. And then I have my figure, uh, this exceedingly happy basketball player. So I'm going to unlock both of these background layers. That always tends to trip me up if I go further back, so I'll just unlock those in the layers palette. And then I'm going to go about removing the green screen from behind this figure. This wasn't photographed particularly well. Some of that has to do with uh, things outside of the photographer's control, but this green screen is not evenly lit, and that makes it a little bit trickier to remove it from the background. So I'm going to walk through what that process would be. Uh, from the select menu at the top, use the color range option and then select something in sort of the most, the greenest spot you can find. And so if I do that, and the fuzziness right now is set to 44, that has to do with the range, you want to keep that as low as you can and try to work around um, the areas where it doesn't pick up the color just perfectly. Because with this dialog box, this image here that shows black and white, I want to get a clean, crisp silhouette of the basketball player. And right now, there's lots of shadows. There's lots of elements in there that don't belong. So I'm going to use the plus option here for the eyedropper. And I'm going to start adding to the field of green that it's picking up. I want to make sure that the Basketball player stays totally a dark silhouette, uh, but I want the background to be almost completely white, with the exception of this little element right here where the green screen wasn't showing. That's not important. I'm going to ignore it. But in just grabbing in some of these areas of shadow, you can see I can clean up the silhouette really well. And even now, just with clicking around a few times, I've gotten a perfectly clean silhouette. So I'll hit OK. It'll show the selection. It's not actually going to be perfect, and I'm not going to walk through the process of cleaning this up to perfection. Typically, I would take an eraser and just go around the edge. Some people use the Refine Edge tool. I prefer more manual methods. But for the purposes of this, I'm just going to delete that background out. Hit Command D to deselect uh, what I currently had selected, and then use an eraser a nice crisp eraser to remove this additional gray element in the corner. And that'll give me my free-floating basketball player. He's still got some green reflection on him uh, down here on the leg. We're actually going to be hiding that though, uh, where he's only going to be seen from about the waist up, so that's not going to give us too much trouble. Instead, green here on the arm, on the face, the neck, we'll have to work a little bit with that. So I'm going to drag him up to my other page, my other tab and drop him in the middle of the plaza here and then it becomes a matter of eye line match I know or horizon match is probably the better phrase to use I know that the camera was a little bit below the eye line of the figure I'm sort of looking up at him and then if I look here in the background obviously the eye line is going to be where these lines converge the lines of these buildings converge I can fudge this a little bit uh, but I'm just gonna make sure that his head is sort of above the eye line present in this landscape image. So about right there seems right. If you're curious when you're placing something in, just try moving it around. Obviously he's a giant if I bring him up here and this just doesn't feel right either. So somewhere in this area feels right based on where the cameras were positioned when each of these photos were taken. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I, this background image is sort of a a dry and dreary cloudy day and I chose that for a reason I wanted the diffused light that comes with a cloudy day 
where the lighting is fairly even, there's not a clear light direction, it gives me the flexibility to sort of install it where I want to. Now if I look at the image of the basketball player, I can see that the light was coming from forward and to, forward and from the right and it's hitting him. There's a glow here on his forehead, so I'm going to try and put it relatively positioned so that that light is coming from the right side of the frame. This is going to require me to do one thing first. I'm going to toggle off the basketball player in the beginning, and that's to create a separation between this building and the sky behind it. This is fairly easy to do. I'm going to use the quick selection tool. Uh, which is up here underneath the lasso. Sometimes you got to click and hold to get to it because the magic wand is visible. But it is a paintbrush in essence. It allows you to paint in a selection. So just like with a paintbrush, I can change the size of that brush using the bracket keys. So I'll make it a little bit bigger here. And then making sure that I have this layer selected, that's extremely important. I'll go ahead and just start creating a selection. That selects everything until it hits opposition, until it hits a line, which should, by virtue of the way the sky looks, do a pretty good job of just selecting the sky and not the building. If I zoom in and look closely, you can see there is a couple of things that it missed. For example, little statues, railings, things like that. So I could always go into the minus option here with this quick selection tool and carve out a little bit more space for, say, these statues and such. It doesn't have to be a perfect selection, but I can certainly get it in the ballpark. You know, if I want to make sure to retain these little elements coming off the side. It does a pretty good job of selecting them. These statues here I'm not really going to worry about. I'll grab the rest of this chimney. But I don't mind knocking off a few ornaments uh, that aren't particularly important anyway. This is one of those situations where Nobody's going to be looking that closely to your background image. It depends on the context. Obviously, you want to do a good job, but there's also a such thing as overdoing it. So what I, I currently have selected is the sky. What I really want to have selected is the building and the plaza. So I'm going to invert this selection. Since basically I grabbed the sky using the quick selection tool, I'll invert it, and that will select everything but the sky. So select inverse and now you can see that the blinking selection, the marching ants as they're often called, have switched. It's now selecting the plaza in the building and then I can hit command J to duplicate that layer. Since I had the selection in place it will only duplicate what was available inside that selection area. So if I turn off my very bottom layer now you can see I've got the plaza in the building but no background. So there's now a separation between these two things. If I really want to show it uh, vividly, I can pull the basketball player down here between them and turn him into a Godzilla basketball figure. You can see he's in front of the sky, but he's behind the building. It's not actually what I want to do here, but that's a good way to demonstrate precisely what I did. The reason why I did that is so I can put some light behind the building, but in front of the sky and get a nice clean result. So I'm going to create a new layer between my original photo and the plaza that I just duplicated. I'm going to call this Sun Glow and I'm going to use the gradient tool. First thing, before I actually select the tool, I'll give myself an orange color from the color picker and then I'll choose the gradient tool over here on the toolbar and make sure that it's set to use the orange and then transparency. You should be able to see that checkered behind it. I also make sure that this is set to radial so you have different kinds of um, gradients here. I'm going to make sure that it's the second one, the radial. Now if I click and I drag a line across the image, it will give me this radial glow. And I can extend that a little bit, I can make it go out further, and then use a blending mode like overlay or screen I honestly think overlay or a setting like that is probably going to be best and I'll reduce the opacity a little bit just give myself an orange glow there in the background. I might also go on top of it with yet another layer and we'll call this Sun Glow Core and I may spread a little bit of almost white something like a nearly yellow or a nearly, nearly white yellow and spread a little bit of that up there as well. 
again dropping opacity things like that just to give a sense of there's light coming from that direction so that's a nice starting point uh, we'll actually probably add something else depending on time uh, moving forward but right now I'm gonna go and look instead to my figure and my background in terms of color so these are very cool they're very um, the background in the very least is very cool because it was a dry and cloudy day so I'm going to add in a color balance layer and I'm going to control click on that layer after I put it above my layer that has the buildings in the plaza and I'm going to create a clipping mask and that's going to clip directly to it and allow me to adjust the color just on that layer I'm going to start with the shadows options from the drop down and I'm going to start bringing a little bit of blue and a little bit of red a little magenta into it just adjusting these slightly to give them sort of a richer cool and warm temperature settings just the midtones a little bit I put in some red I put in some yellow I didn't really mess with uh, the magenta and green that much the highlights also I like to put a little bit of cyan in there sometimes maybe a little yellow you can also push that to red to warm it more it just feels like a bit much it's really a judgment call dependent based on what the image is like just trying to bring the color into it these these changes I make are so subtle it's hard to even see them taking place unless you toggle it off and on and then you can see how I've sort of injected some red and warmth and pulled out some green a lot of times the camera interprets green where the human eye doesn't really see it as much and so you can give a more idealized warm happy photo by pulling some of that green out so we did that to the background I'm gonna give the same treatment to the figure but it's good to manipulate these separately rather than together here in the beginning so I'm gonna add a color balance layer above him and clip it to that figure layer and then the same thing but here we're, we're contending with some of that green glow that comes onto the skin so I'm going to add in just a hint of blue, a little bit of cyan, a little bit of magenta into the shadow areas, and then midtones are trickier because I've got to keep the warmth of the skin while still pulling out some of the green. Uh, highlights as well. I don't want to get too rosy with the skin, so sometimes I'll up the cyan and the magenta just a little, and maybe a little bit more yellow now if I toggle that off and on you can see the difference it darkens up some areas but it pulls the green out of the figure makes the color richer ruddier more appealing I'm not gonna go in and focus on areas pulling out some of the green glow I'm just gonna do that more general version uh, because that gets me roughly where I need to be in terms of this image for the next step now that I've made those uh, sort of small adjustments I really don't like the blue <laughs> in the figure uh, so we're gonna make some adjustment to that it's really has to do with the blue in the jersey and the blue on the basketball I don't think they mesh well with the color palette that I'm sort of injecting into this so I'm gonna do this a little bit clumsily it's not gonna be completely clean but from a distance it's going to look good uh, I'm gonna do a selecting color range just like we did before with the green screen but I'm going to grab some of these areas of blue and try to get just those selected so basically what I should be able to see in here is the stripes the shoulders that sort of stuff and I'll get a selection on that and hit OK and once that selections in place and I mean I can already tell by looking looking at it it's it's not perfect I could uh, grow it a little bit by zooming in here you can see that this has sort of tons of spots in it I could take something like the uh, the quick selection tool and fill that out to get a better selection and that will help try not to overdo it here <laughs> this can get out of hand pretty quickly if you're not careful I just want to make sure that I get these elements selected so that I actually can change their color I'm essentially gonna take these accents these little pieces and I am gonna alter the color to remove the blue
So if I then, after making that selection, go and grab a hue saturation, it's going to go ahead and throw it in there. It's going to automatically, because the layer above it was clipped, it's going to automatically clip it to the figure. And then I can use this colorize option and tweak the color to get something that's in a more in the area of teal. I feel like that matches better. It gives a, a little bit of sense of the uh, background dome that has that copper, that old copper patina on it that comes across as teal. So something like that is a little bit better. If I feel like I've overdone it, I can always drop the opacity a little bit or go back in and tweak the color a little bit more. But I think it's better than it was. Uh, another thing that I would do in this case is I'm going to go back to the sky and I'm going to actually I think probably the best approach here is uh, to add some additional highlights to the background plaza so I'm going to create a curves layer that should clip to it automatically again because there's already a color balance above it clipped and I'm going to boost the light quite a bit more than I need to uh, just with that curves layer and then I'll select the mask inside the Photoshop layers palette and I'll hit command I to invert it that basically causes it to disappear entirely and then I can go and paint it back in wherever I feel like it's appropriate so I'll take a brush with white and I'll drop the opacity of the brush a little bit you know 60 percent maybe I'll drop it down 260 and then I'm going to be thinking about this light direction where would it hit where would the light strike if it is coming from the same direction where it's influencing the figure so that helps me understand that some extra light should fall on this area a little bit extra light would fall here on the center but there would still be shadows sort of coming down on this right side so I'm not going to add highlight there now if I if I toggle that you can see how going in and brightening it helps give a sense of the direction of the light I might soften it up a little bit I don't want it to be too intense but I do want there to be a difference there as far as what the sun would be hitting and that again just kinda gives a little bit of strength to the argument that these were taking under, taken under the same lighting conditions now for the next part that I was sort of debating on doing a moment ago I'll create a new layer above my sun glow core I think is what it I called it. I'm going to call this sun rays. Uh, this is a technique that I picked up actually a really long time ago and I've been using with varying levels of success for some time but it basically involves taking the polygonal lasso tool which allows you to just kind of click point to point and to not do what I just did. That was a, a truly terrible job of using it. Uh, clicking point to point to create sort of these beams of light that stretch across the sky. These would be again assuming that they come from this side where the lights coming from. I might could have done a better job of choosing you know their precise angle and such but if I do something like that and again I have my own layer set up to do this a blank layer I go to the edit and fill option and I'm gonna choose a, a color let's let's actually go in here and use a color for it. something that's like a really bright yellow and hit OK and it will fill it with that and I can hit command D to deselect now obviously that doesn't look like sun rays at all not even in the ballpark but if I take it uh, selecting that layer and going up to the blur options I can use the Gaussian blur and if I increase that radius enough I can get kind of sort of a sense of light rays moving in the background so I took it up to 45 pixels blur set it to a blending mode like maybe screen maybe color dodge maybe overlay I kinda of like the look of overlay you know drop the opacity a little bit they probably wouldn't extend across the sky with the exact same level of strength from beginning to end so I'll take a low opacity big soft brush and sort of soften these up a little bit here and there you know maybe they're not all at the exact same level of strength so I'll weaken one or two here so that they feel a little bit more dynamic
And what you get is a little bit of character to a sky. And you could spend some time with that, you know, getting it to look just right. In this case, I don't think it's it's wholly necessary. Uh, I am going to add a, at the, at the top of everything, I'm going to go in and add a photo filter. I don't use these a lot. But I'm going to throw a warming filter on there. You can see how it sort of warms up the image. And I'm going to give it a similar treat treatment as what I did with curves of inverting the mask so that I can go back in and paint areas where I want things to be warmer or cooler. So I can paint in warmth on areas where the light would be hitting and avoiding areas where the light wouldn't hit as much. So, you know, I can throw in some warmth on these shoulders, down the leg, maybe a little bit sort of stretched across the ground here. And you, it's one of those things you don't see a huge difference. You just see sort of a subtle difference. Photoshop is really about building subtle differences on top of one another until you get a result, something that's completely different. So if I take what I have at this point, and I sort of toggle everything off except for these two original layers, you can see how the slow addition of these elements begins to give you a drastically different result at the end. None of them themselves are enormous. None of them by themselves are significant. But that slow build, thinking towards how would the light operate? How would the light work on these different elements, the location and the figure? So if they were indeed taken as a f one photo in this location under this lighting. And then you simply try to facilitate it using the tools that you have available to you.